For those of you who are under 30, this is an ancient artifact called a map. It's possible if uh, your car was given to you, you may have one of these in your car in a thing called a glove box in your dash. That's that panel in front of you your steering wheel goes into. Over in front of the passenger seat, there's this box you can open up. And there may be one of these in there. It's called a map. It's an artifact from the distant past that would help you find your way to where you wanted to go. So you had to know where you were. And then you would find that on the map. And then you find it, you, where do I want to go? You'd find the street name. You'd look it up alphabetically. And then you would find over here on the right a little letter and number, F7. And then you would open up the map and you'd go to F7 and you'd find a little box. And then you'd have to look in the box until you found where you wanted to go. And then you had to see where you were and figure out how you were going to get there turn by turn. It was a complicated device. The hardest part, though, was folding it back up when you were done. That was the hardest part. Today, we have this. And you don't need to know where you are because it does. All you need to know is the address of where you want to go. You type it in, you hit go, start, directions, and it will get you there turn by turn. It'll tell you how long it's going to take for you to get there. If you're walking, you can press a little walking man icon, and it'll show you how to walk there. If you're in a car, it's got a car. It's even got public transportation where you can press the little bus button, and it'll tell you get off here, go over to this stop, get on this bus. It's amazing. It even has a little voice. You can, in your car, you, you can put it out, and a little voice will tell you, in a quarter mile, turn left at, and then they always mispronounce the street. <laughs> but you know, you can figure it out. And, and uh, 800 feet, you're going to turn left, you know. And if you miss your turn, it'll tell you, recalculating, and it'll tell you how to get back on track and how to arrive at your destination. This is similar. It knows where we are. And it tells us how to get to where we want to go. Where do we want to go? We want to go to heaven. I hope you want to go to heaven. It knows where you are. And this gives us the map on how to get there. It also knows all of us are going to make wrong turns. Every one of us. So it tells us what to do when we get off track. How to get back on track so that we can arrive safely at our destination. We're returning to the same passage that we looked at last Sunday. It's Jesus' last night with the boys. They've just shared their final meal. It's almost over when, when Jesus rises from the table. He takes off his tunic. He puts on a work apron, fills a basin with water, and he goes around and he washes the disciples' feet. He works his way around the table until he arrives at Peter. Look at verse 6 of John 13. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? As we saw last week, the task of the foot washer was usually assigned to the lowest, the youngest servant, slave, or member of the household because it was the most, well, quite frankly, humiliating position. Luke tells us in his gospel of the same night, the same last meal, that the disciples were doing during the meal, which lasted several hours, what we find them doing more than anything else in the Gospels, arguing over who was the greatest. And they were doing it at the last meal. So Jesus shows them who's greatest. He rises, and he takes the lowest place. And then he tells them, the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of, is the servant of all. He flips the world's ideas on greatness and glory upside down and takes this place that is the lowest, but by doing so becomes the greatest. You see, the, had been, there had been no provision made for the disciples' feet to be washed. A couple of disciples that had acquired the room and had set up the meal had, never, had not made provision for, for anybody to, to wash feet. There was nothing there ahead of time for them to do when they, they came in. And so they sit through dinner with dirty, stinky feet until Jesus rises and takes care of them. 
And when he arrives at Peter, Pete thought that this would be his chance to earn points in the debate over who's greatest. All the disciples didn't say anything when Jesus is making his way around the table because they're embarrassed. And Peter waits till they're all done, and then he says, oh man, none of them said anything. I know what Jesus is doing. He's waiting for someone to say no, and I'll show my great spiritual insight here. When Jesus arrives in me, I'll say, no, Lord, not me. And so he says, Lord, are you, are you washing my feet? The implication is, well, you know, what are you doing? You don't belong down there. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. God uh, probably said it just like that, you know. Expecting that Jesus is going to say to him, oh, Pete, at least one of you has some spiritual insight. That's not what Jesus says. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do, do not understand now, but you will know after this. As we saw last week, Jesus' humble service in washing their feet foreshadowed the cross. When he did it, the disciples were embarrassed on his behalf. But later on the other side of the cross, looking back, they realized his going around the table and washing their feet was an act of consummate love and care for them, foreshadowing an even greater manifestation of that love a few hours later when he went to the cross. But before the cross, Peter doesn't understand what Jesus is doing. And so verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered them, if you do not wash, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you. Peter resisted the Lord's service. And Jesus warned him that by doing so, he, he risked being cut off. Get this. To belong to Jesus, we must let him clean us. This exchange between Jesus and Peter is, a, is an amazing picture of how many people, maybe most people, end up coming to faith. You see, just as Jesus approached Peter with this basin, the gospel comes to us with the offer of cleansing. But we have to admit our need. We have to admit our need of being cleansed. And most of us at first were not inclined to admit it. Lord, we say with Peter, you want to wash my feet? Why? What's wrong with my feet? And then he shows us. They're grody. They're gross. Jesus said to Peter, you don't get what I'm doing now, but you will. And that's us when the Holy Spirit begins to convict us. I would ask you, go back and remember how when you first came to Christ, how the Holy Spirit was convicting you. You were doing stuff, you'd been doing stuff all your life, you were just fine with it, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, stuff that you had been doing for years, all of a sudden, you started becoming uncomfortable with it. Amen? Amen? Stuff you thought was just fine. All of a sudden, you begin to realize, man, this stuff, this is bad. I, I, I'm uncomfortable with this. I, I need to do better. I need to change. I, I, I wish I could get rid of this stuff. Why is it I struggle? I mean, the Holy Spirit's convicting us. Then years later, on the other side of the cross, you look back and you realize, man, that was the Holy Spirit convicting me, showing me my feet stink. Just before the cross, while we're still being convicted and we haven't surrendered to Christ yet, what many of us do is what Pete does. Is we, we say, okay, I admit I'm wrong, but instead of letting the Lord clean us, what we do is we say, I'll take care of it. Okay, I finally recognize, Whoa, what is that? I need to clean my feet. Enter religion. Enter reform, enter resolutions and vows and self-improvement programs. That's where it all comes from. False religion, man-made religion, the recognition something's wrong. I'll do this to fix myself. But all that does is move the muck from our feet to our hands. That's all it does. We must let Jesus clean us. And that's my question to you today. Have you let him? Have you let Jesus clean you? Let him forgive and cleanse you because only he can.
Now, it's the exchange that happens next that we want to focus on. Look at verse 9. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. (laughs) The thought of being cut off from Jesus terrified Peter, and so he swings the other way. Okay, forget about my feet. I'm all in. It's bath time. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, he was bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. And then the next verse, John explains Jesus there at the end was talking about about Judas. But it's verse 10 where I want to camp today. Look at it again. Jesus says, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. You, the disciples, are clean. Jesus is drawing on something here that they would immediately connect to because they're Jews, and that was the ritual for priests. In the book of Exodus, we find the ritual for those that were priests to be consecrated into their office and then their daily practice. Now, here's what would happen. When a descendant of the tribe of Levi, a male, arrived at a certain age, he could begin his service as a priest. And it would begin by a bath, a ritual bath that was quite elaborate from head to toe. They would be bathed, they'd come out of the water, they would dry off, and they would put on their priestly garments and they would begin their service. But every time they went in to serve before the Lord, they would have to wash their hands and their feet. They would do so by going into the temple grounds and this big bronze basin called the laver. And they would wash their hands and they would wash their feet. This is what they needed to do, not a full bath, just to wash their hands and their feet. Why? Well, because they would come in contact with uh, things that defile them in the course of just daily life. And in order to do a priest's job, which is to stand before a holy God on behalf of people and to stand before people on behalf of a holy God, they needed to wash their hands and to wash their feet. Peter didn't need a bath. He already had one. In just a few minutes, Jesus will say to the disciples, you are already clean through the word that I have spoken to you. Though their faith has a long way to go, there is enough of faith in who Jesus is at this point to bring them into relationship with him. And because they are in relationship with him, they have provision for ongoing cleansing. Now, think of it this way. Uh, You'll remember we described the roads that they walked on last week. They're, They're dirt roads where everybody throws their refuse, their trash, their bedpans, their sewage. It all goes out there, and that's what people walk in. That's why you wash your feet before you go in the house. So imagine now you live at that time. You've been invited to a friend's house for a party. You've been told it's a special party. So you want to go prepared. What do you do? You're at home. You take a bath. You put on your best duds. But you have to walk to their house. Now, when you arrive at their house, do you need to take another bath or do you need to just wash your feet? You just need to wash your feet. You're already clean, right? But the process of getting from your house to their house has taken you on those streets. Christian, please hear me. You've been born again. You're the son. You're the daughter of God. You've been washed by virtue of your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been baptized spiritually into him. You're now born again. You're saved. You're going to heaven, but you're not there yet. You live in a world that is corrupt and decayed and full of death and sin. And as you live in this world, as you make your way to heaven, you're getting bespattered and besmatched with all of that muck and that mire. You don't need to be saved again. You just need to be cleansed. You just need to be washed. In 1 John 1, 9, we read these words. If we confess, and the verb tense is, if we're continually confessing, keep that in mind. If we're continually confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Continual confession is important because it removes the obstacles to our fellowship with God. Psalm 66 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. That word phrase regard in my heart, it means if I'm holding on to something. If I regard sin in my heart, if I'm holding on to sin, God won't listen. Isaiah 59 says that 
Sin breaks fellowship with God. Confession is dealing honestly with sin, admitting that it's wrong and asking God to restore his favor. And here's where I need to make a distinction between two words we use a lot in the Christian faith. And and it's my hope that when we leave today, you'll understand these words like you've never understood them before. Let me share an illustration here that I hope will unpack this. We have a couple of naval bases that are nearby here. Um, uh, We have the CB base, construction battalion base. Uh, There are different battalions there that are on the base, and they go out on deployment. So imagine now you have a sailor. He's married, his wife, and he are in covenant. Their relationship is husband and wife. Let me ask you, does that relationship change? No, they're husband and wife, right? They're in covenant, husband, wife. He goes on deployment for nine months to Cutter. Are they in fellowship? Fellowship is intimate communion. It's, it's, it's communication. It's sharing. It's a mutual sharing. She's here in Wainimi, in Oxnard. He's in Cutter, halfway around the world. Are they in fellowship? No. Distance has separated them. Are they still in relationship? Okay, are they in fellowship? There you go. How many of you know that you can be in the same room as someone and not be in fellowship with them? A bunch of husbands and wives just went, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. It's possible. happens all the time. We, We say something, we do something that offends the other person, and we're sitting there, you know, is everything okay? Yeah. Really? Because they don't seem like they are. Why would you get that impression? You know? Okay, so you realize you're out of fellowship with your... And by the, you're still married. That's, the relationship hasn't changed, but the fellowship has changed because there's been an offense, some kind of hurt, something that's happened. How do we get back into fellowship? What do we do? We, we admit we messed up. Now, one of us needs to admit we messed up. What does the other one need to do? Forgive. All right, forgive, let it go. Okay, here's, here's the point. We are in relationship with God. We are the, the children of God. We are in covenant with him because of the work of Jesus Christ. Is that going to change? No. Are we in fellowship with him? Well, if we've sinned, if we're regarding sin in our heart, no. We've broken fellowship. What do we do? Okay, but before we get to that, let me just say this. God is the one that forgives. He never offends. We're the, we're the offenders. He's always the forgiver. But, but let me ask you, what's his posture towards you? It's always this. I'm ready. I want to forgive. I got a bunch of it. It's right here. It's ready to go. It's an inexhaustible supply of grace and mercy. It's all yours. All you got to do is confess. Admit you're a knucklehead. Admit you messed up. And just admit it. Just confess it. You see, confession, the word in Greek means to agree with. To agree with. Yes, God, I admit it. See, here's, what we, here's too often what we do. We sin, and instead of admitting it when the Holy Spirit's convicting us, what we do is, well, is it really sin? I mean, you know, we, we rationalize, we excuse. You know, well, what about everybody else? It's, no, we just confess. We just admit. I I messed up. If we confess our sins, if, if we do that, he is, what? Faithful. Stop right there. He's faithful. Because he's made a promise. If you will do this, I'll do my part. Okay? And he, listen, he's faithful and just. He's just. It's right for him to do it. Why? Because Jesus Christ has already paid for all our sins. That's what he said. It paid in full. It is finished. That's what he said. All of, all of the sins that you haven't committed yet, Jesus has already paid for. How does that forgiveness come to us? When we confess and say, Lord, forgive me. So he's faithful and just because the sins that we need forgiveness for, he's already paid for. So he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and... Cleanse us from what? 
all unrighteousness. There is no sin. There is no sin this doesn't apply to. He will forgive everything we bring to him. All of it. No matter how offensive, no matter how stinky, he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This is a little bottle of antibacterial hand rub. Some of you ladies have one of these in your purse. Some of us have this in, one of these in our car, and we live in a world we know about germs, you know, and they can make you sick. And so before we eat, you know, we, we put this on our hands. Some of us in ministry, we shake a lot of hands, and then people aren't looking, we're like this. And <laughs> If you have kids, you probably have one of these. <laughs> think of confession. Think of confession as kind of a spiritual version of, one of, of that. When you confess, you're bringing the forgiveness and the cleansing of God to your life to cleanse away the stuff that stinks, the stuff that breaks fellowship first with him and then with others. Please hear the words again. And, and, and it, listen, picture Jesus kneeling at Peter's feet and having this interchange with him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Yeah, Pete, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will later. <laughs> Lord, you're never, you're never going to wash my feet. I'll take care of my feet. Pete, if you don't let me do this, you, you, you don't have any part with me. You've broken fellowship. You've got to let me do this for you. Well, what we need to do is, oh, Lord, do it. My feet reeks. Clean it, Lord. And as you picture that scene, Jesus kneeling there and washing his feet, listen to this. If we confess our sins continually, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.